As uh, NSL Dre worked very hard to get um, to get to put together what I think will be an exciting uh, and really engaging discussion, um, featuring a lot of the distinguished NSI experts uh, today. So um, NSI and NSLJ have worked together for as long as NSI has been around. Actually, NSLJ has been around a little bit longer than NSI. I think they celebrated their 10-year uh, anniversary uh, this year. So uh, congratulations to you guys. Um, and uh, uh, just for having this impactful presence on, on the campus. Um, so I won't, I won't take up any more time. Uh, really thank you for, for coming here today. Uh, and I'm happy to pass the podium over to the other Alex, the one running the show today, uh, NSLJ's Editor-in-Chief, Alex Buttram. Thanks. Our moderator is Andrea Limbago who is the Vice President for Research and Analysis at Interos. Uh, Interos is a global provider of supply chain services specializing in AI-powered modeling and visualization tools. Uh, before moving to Interos, Ms. Limbago worked for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center. While there, she earned the Reginald Gray Award, which is that command's highest award for technical excellence. I also want to recognize and introduce William Avon Evanina, excuse me, uh, who spent 31 distinguished years in federal service, 24 of which were as a special agent with the FBI. In 2020, Mr. Evanina was confirmed by the United States Senate as the first director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, or NCSC, and in that capacity, he led the nation's counterintelligence and insider threat response efforts. Today, he is the CEO of the Evanina Group, which advises CEOs and corporate boards on strategic risks, as well as a member of the National Security Institute's advisory board. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Limbago and Mr. Evanina to Scalia Law. Yeah? How about this? Hello, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. All right, well, there's gonna be no shortage of topics when we're talking about something as broad as AI and friend or foe, which I think is even it's a nice way to even think about it as a dual-use technology, which it isn't often thought that way. So what I want to do, actually, just to kick it off with Bill, is, is thinking about a lot of discussion about machine learning, AI, over the last decade plus. When you think about AI, and when you start talking about AI, and especially when you think about generative AI, that is increasingly what people are referring to, what do you even mean when, when, when you hear that? So that's a great question. First, I'm very humbled and honored to be here uh, as part of this great tandem with Andrea. And it's a great conversation that I think is really important for, for everyone here, but important for our, na our nation to understand uh, the complexity of AI and ML. And to that question, I think that's first question is part of the problem, right? What is AI? What is ML? How do they interact? Are they the same? Are they different? And I can go back to where I first heard of AI, which is probably a decade ago uh, in my role in the intelligence community and the FBI, and, and then we saw all our adversaries spending a lot of money <clears throat> in AI, and we are like, what the heck is AI? Like, why are our adversaries spending so much money in artificial intelligence? And then the Department of Defense started saying, hey, we need to really boost up our machine learning capabilities, and we, st we need to utilize artificial intelligence for machine learning. And I could just see our government employees like, what? What, is that like analytics? Or what, what is that, and what, what is machine learning? What machines? Are computers, like weapon systems? There was a lot of like, what are we talking about here? So I would say probably in 2015 to 16, we started to get a little bit more, oh, we get it now. We saw the private sector moving forward on with AI. We saw a lot of our big tech companies utilizing AI right in front of us that we didn't know was AI. In the government, I'll proffer that we were probably a decade behind. Primarily because, you know, to answer the question about the machine learning, a lot of our legacy machines in the government aren't postured for aggressive AI capabilities. Now, AI being the ability to drive thought and capabilities um, to beat the human is, you know, goes back to the Gary Kasparov days, you know, where, you know, there's, there's chess, there's computers. I think right now we are um, in a space in our country where people hear AI and ML and they just gloss through it and they don't really know what it means. And I think that's uh, why we're having this conversation here uh, today. And I think it's really important that AI and ML will 
not to steal my, my last couple of books, needs to be integrated into early childhood education, right? It needs to be in elementary school and high school. And, when, and we're so concentrated on taking computer science class, right, and, and coding. Well, AI, ML has to be a part of that process academically as well. Oh, great. Thank you. And there's a lot that can be you know, talked about and discussed in, in that area. And so maybe even thinking about if we start you know, training and educating the population in this area, where do you see some of the biggest promises where AI can have a positive impact, both you know, on our economic security, national security? Where, where do you see it really driving some positive change? So uh, I'll, I'll go back to my, you know, I've been out of the government now two years. We saw a lot of intelligence capabilities really progressed from, say, 2016, 15, 16 to 2001 um, astronomically with AI, with the ability for private sector companies to come in and help boast boost up intelligence communities' capabilities, right? So it was a perfect blend because the government doesn't have AI capabilities yet, right? But they can procure it from outside vendors to come in and help drive analytics to better, better perform, not only with you know regressing data that we see, but also some of the data we steal around the world to be able to drive analytics and use that AI to be able to predict things around the world. So that was my experience with AI from not only our capabilities that were growing in the intelligence community, but more importantly, what we saw our adversaries doing and how do we build an AI framework around that. Subsequent to leaving government in my private role now, I see that AI driving, you know, in the financial institutions, the medical community right now, there's hardly anything that happens in a hospital that's not driven by AI. In the cancer world, in the research world, um, in the medical biopharm world, it's all driven by AI didn't start last year, they've been doing it for a long time. We just are a long-term catching up, and probably a decade with some of the bigger industries. Advanced manufacturing is all AI. You know, when you think about big companies like Google and Amazon and the warehousing, it's all driven by AI. And when you're at home, and if you're using one of the, you know, voice activated, they already know what you're gonna ask before you ask it, right? So when you say, hey Amazon, can you order? They already know what you're gonna order, because it's 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, and typically at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, you order your bonbons, right? So they know that. So it's, uh, it, to me, that's amazing when you think about how we live th with AI in our daily ecosystems, and we don't even know it. And so, to that point, AI is already here. It's already deeply implemented in our society, across really the, the core industries that drive our economy within our national security apparatus. Did we jump in without thinking about security considerations? And at what point? Where do we stand right now as far as security risks that go along with the adoption of, of AI? Well, that's a great question, and I would say yes. Um, when you say we jumped in, the private sector jumped in 15 years ago or so, they never think about security, right? They just don't, right? Because it's security to them is a loss leader. It's a cost of functionality to minimize effectiveness and efficiencies. And I can give you an example that um, until we blew in the face. But yes, and I think now we're starting to see the big tech companies and the financial services institutions right now having run up against security and they're starting to see the advanced capabilities of adversary and criminal elements breaking into the data, right? So if you have dirty data, you're gonna have dirty AI. And if you can't control the provenance of the data and you can't protect the data, you're not gonna be able to protect the AI that's driven results. So I think the financial institutions are really concerned about that now. They're starting to say, okay, wait a minute. Can we go back? a decade now and then put security parameters in something that's already been built? And the answer is no, they just can't. That's never happened, it's never gonna be able to happen. Because And then when you talk about software, the software that drives AI is constantly moving at light speed. So when financial institutions or the medical uh, biopharma community is constantly buying new and better software, they're not thinking about how that's secure or where it's coming from and doing due diligence on who built it. Was it out of China or Russia or Iran? They're just, hey, does it make our product more faster and more effective and more efficient? That's what the private sector is supposed to do. It's a capitalist economy. So now, yes, we are now slowing down saying, okay, how do we, especially now as our data centers and our cloud service providers are really concerned about the data in their cloud, right? Can it be penetrated? Can it be dirtied up? And what if we get to a point and AI is generating type of an analytics and products for people, but it's based upon corrupted data? So that, that now you're starting to see the security industry be playing more of a role in the R&D and the uh, mission side of AI. Yeah. 
No, that's interesting. And I think we were, as we were talking about earlier this morning that Google put out a bug bounty now on generative AI, which I think is, is interesting to show to some of the evolution where the private sector is starting to think about this and starting to understand some of the security risks that go along with it. On the national security side, there's recently been uh, some export bans on you know, AI enabling you know, microchips and so forth as well. Where do, where's the, you know, on the technology side, if we're moving towards looking at security and addressing some security concerns with it, what's, what's going on on the legal side of AI? Well, I think the legal side is the most complicated side. I mean, we, you're talking about being 15 years behind the curve. Uh, the legal community is probably 25 years behind the curve when it comes to AI. And, and, and we talked earlier, and I was in New York City yesterday with financial services sector, and, and one of the senior bankers said, hey, my son's a uh, freshman at law school, which I have him major in or specialize in. I said AI, ML, technology, driven analytics, because there's so few lawyers in the next decade is going to be all about litigation. It's going to all be about court order. And then just think about the complexity we are in right now with just 5G and cyber and the, and the complexity of litigation, lawsuits, legal, court of appeals on things that are so complicated, clerks of judges don't understand it. Now you extrapolate that to AI and ML, right? And you think about someone sues a big tech company because something that was derived from AL, AI helped them procure a product that's now in 10,000 vehicles and they're suing. You're going to need the people that are in around the court. Just think about the people, the law, the law ecosystem, the attorneys, the judges, the, the staffers. They got to be educated on this before you put it in front of a jury, right? Just think about some of the most complicated white collar crimes we've had in the last decade. This is going to be time times ten. And I think if you, if you think this is not going to happen, it's already here. Now you're starting to see some of the big tech companies are concerned about legal issues in Europe with the GDPR, right, and the ability for privacy. No one's thought about privacy with AI and ML. Nobody. If they say they have, they're lying to you, right, because it's all about efficiency of scale, and the privacy issue is going to be a big issue when it comes to uh, loss, lawsuits because the data is dirty. I think the legal issue is probably the biggest albatross around AI becoming what it's supposed to be in the next 10 years. And we've seen some of those lawsuits already. Everything from there's a slander lawsuit out of Australia because of some of the, the disinformation that popped out of uh, you know, some generative AI. Uh, GitHub Copilot is under some, some, some lawsuits. We're starting to see some of those already starting to emerge, and a lot of it is linked back to that bad data mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Where do you see progress getting made in the U.S. on something along these lines? And you know, what happens if the U.S. basically stays stagnant? and thinking about global competition, right? So if the U.S. plays by one set of rules and some of the authoritarian regimes really don't have a rule of law or have any kind of considerations or data constraints in what they're doing, how do you see this evolving as far as a, you know, global competition? So sweet spot for me, um, this is really complicated because I see us being very competitive now. I see the U.S. being neck and neck with China on uh, AI development, research, and utilization in the real world. I see us neck and neck. My concern is the European Union and the U.S. government's amazing ability to slow things down, right? And I think that uh, the White House has come out now saying, hey, we're going to have a framework for AI policies in a month or two. Well, this was supposed to come out a year or two, but for every day that goes by in, in policy formulation, that's like three years of technology, right? So I'm not sure they'll catch up, but I do see... Uh, the storm clouds forming here where the government, and hopefully not Congress, is going to put a wrench in the works here that's going to cause a delay for industries, you know, a solid train they're on. And we have to stand that a solid train technology-wise and not let it go back to a regional rail and not let it go back to a cog railway because you're going to really stifle innovation. And the U.S. government for decades has been really good at stifling innovation. Um, and that's unfortunate, but sometimes good. We live in a democracy. There's always uh, pushes and pulls. I do think, just like in all technology, semiconductors and other chips, we need to stay equal with China right now on AI and machine learning. And we have to let, to me, let the process run itself out, let the private sector research development, the big tech, drive this. Because big tech is not a U.S.-based ecosystem. You know, you talk about you know, Google, Amazon, those things are those global companies. Facebook, global company. So for the U.S. government to come in and put frameworks around their development, how does that impact things in Southeast Asia and South America? So I think we really have to think 
long and hard, and I think this is an opportunity for the government, the government, Congress, the White House, to put together an amazing coalition, Blue Ribbon Task Force, of all the people that matter here together to come up with what works, to be able to keep us a, a sound democracy, keep the fairness, privacy, civil liberties issues. At the same time, do not stifle progress. That's great. And where do you see, you know, if the allies and democracies were to go that route, where do you envision the authoritarian regimes going over the next five, 10 years with AI? Well, great question, Andrew. I'd say they're already there. I mean, if you look at China and what they're doing uh, with the Uyghurs and now what they're doing with genetic coding, it's all AI-based, right? In order to have the most effective and efficient AI, you have them have the most data. So when you look at what the Chinese are doing with respect to DNA testing of every single human being in China, right, that provides them unbelievable data. So when you look at the Uyghurs who are all being prison because they're identified through DNA collection with AI and analytics, those authoritarian regimes are stifling, I would say, you know, ethnicity, you know, and building the master race, number one. So if they're doing that inside their country, now they're looking at you know, all the COVID testing they stole around the world. They're driving analytics against that and AI to be able to build a worldwide ecosystem of DNA. That's not for good reasons, right? So now I don't think Iran is ever gonna get to a place where they have the technology to do this. So our, my biggest concern is, is China, and we've already seen them since Xi Jinping came into power in 2013, be very authoritative, be very vicious to their own people. So I think that's, and because of that, and because they don't have a rule of law there, that's gonna put more pressure on us in the EU to say if we slow things down, China's just gonna keep going at an incredible pace. Yes, that obviously sounds very daunting and very dystopian for a future uh, if, if we were to go down that path. How can companies protect against the malicious use of AI against themselves? So I think, and uh, great questions and, and conversation yesterday in New York City with the financial services sector about this. Um, as, we, as we continue to build the most fascinating constructs of AI and then apply that to machine learning and other things, we have to now start thinking about uh, red teaming it, right? How, how, do, how are we gonna know if we have dirty data, right? Because your AI is only as good as the data provenance, right? Do you know where your data's from and where it came from? Is it reliable? Is it, can, you, can you really trust that data to be true? Because if you can't, then you can't trust that what comes out of it at the end of, as an end product. So I think right now, as much as we're moving fast and we are moving at light speed on AI, I think you're starting to see a couple big sectors, energy, financial services, the telecom sector, and certainly the medical biofield slowing down a little bit to say, wait a minute, we have to figure out how do we protect the data that's so critical. At the same time, we're starting to see our adversaries find a way into that data, right? Because the first time we see an AI-derived capability, we find out that an adversary put dirty data in there or went in and changed data, we're going to have a big problem, right? Because then now all AI-derived uh, products are going to be questioned. And I think we can't allow that to happen because that will really slow down progress. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of the leading think tanks, a lot of the leading companies right now putting billions, trillions of dollars in, into that area, both on the advances and the security side of it. Where do you see the U.S. government going as far as intelligence operations and leveraging some of the benefits of AI? For, for national security purposes? So I think the US government is, you wanna talk about bifurcated operations, depending on what agency you ask, right? So uh, to me, I think AI could serve the US government phenomenally well in two big areas, social security and IRS. They have the worst legacy systems that we know, right? So my question is, can we, and I'm not a, a CIO type, but can we take legacy systems in those organizations and put them through the gauntlet of standardizing your data so that we could use AI towards it. So if we could do that, Department of Education, big data sets, like you would think that would be smart to do. I'm not sure we can get there, I hope that we can, but you have to condition all the data first. Secondarily, in the Intel community, uh, there's a big catch up, right? I know the intelligence community is, has a big push to understand AI and how it could be used, not only to use our own data, but our adversaries' data, right? And then try and mimic, knowing, full well knowing, China has all this data. Can we create our own AI ecosystem to be able to mirror what they know about us? That's the challenge right now that we have so we can preempt their ability to use that AI data 
uh, for you and I, if they have all of our PII, what can they use that for right now? We have to mirror that. And then I think this is an opportunity, again, uh, and I'm a big public-private partnership guy, where the intelligence community is going to have to partner with big tech. And that's going to cause a lot of political heartache on both sides of the aisle. But if, the, if we don't partner with big tech to be able to aggregate, disaggregate, condition data, and use it for national security, we're going to keep falling behind uh, countries like China and the ability to do that. No, no, what you just got me thinking a bit about, you know, obviously the, the data is fundamental, and I think that often gets overlooked in any of these kind of discussions. There's also been a sort of a adjacent discussion going on about the issue of, of Chinese data going dark, that we're losing access to some aspects of Chinese data as they've got their tightening in on their, their data sovereignty laws, not allowing their data to, to flow externally. We saw it with supply chains where data on maritime traffic, one of some of the big main sources basically just plummeted once their data privacy law came into place. And so how do you see that progressing when, especially in authoritarian regimes, they're letting less and less of their, their citizens' data and any of the, any of their corporations' data out? How do you imagine that impacting both you know, some intelligence operations, but also you know, companies and, the, and their own ability to even perhaps um, have their supply chains in China, perhaps lose access to some of their data? How do you see that unfolding? It, you just, <laughs> your, your premise is like perfect, right? It's like an article all by itself because from the intelligence community, and you know, you think about the CIA, you know, their, their role is to identify the plans and intentions of foreign leaders and activities, right? A lot of that's by stealing stuff. And you know, when we look at the inability to steal stuff and you know, partnership with the NSA, um, it used to be that we had opportunities, let's say honestly, to steal Chinese data in Hong Kong. Well, now Hong Kong is basically China, and it's, they've blocked off all that data, right? Any company's data that was used to be a decade ago available for worldwide consumption is no longer available. So our data sets from an intelligence community are, are restricted, but also hurts U.S. commerce, right? So now the U.S. commerce, the companies, the top Fortune 200, 2,000 companies don't have access to that same data as well in China or around the world where China is partnering in Belt and Road and restricting their data. You multiply that times the EU and their restriction, it really becomes complicated with respect to how do we get data. For my old spook world, it's really complicated because you want to say, we used to be able to go in through certain uh, methods and ways to get data, now we can't do that. Um, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging. Yeah, no, for sure. And on that note, I think we'll open up some questions. I've got plenty more, but I want to let the audience uh, engage in this conversation. There, there certainly is no shortage of additional areas to talk about, so I, I don't know whether we bring a microphone around to someone who, maybe back in the back row. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that <laughs> works. <laughs> Thank you two so much for coming today. Um, a lot of the talk was centered on sort of the hard science applications of AI within a national security context. I'm wondering a little bit about perhaps the social science uh, applications uh, relating to national security. Um, there's the advent of these sort of character-based AIs where it's a generative AI platform that you assign a certain personality, certain goals, and people have already on the consumer end integrated these characters into video games where you can talk to a video game character. Um, and I think there's a bit of a worry here where you could start integrating this into social media sites and have a very intelligent generative AI character who perhaps is given an assigned role of radicalizing people online and is able to go do that on Facebook, on other social media platforms. Um, where do you see, but on the other hand, you could also use something like this for wargaming, for setting an AI with an adversarial agenda and then running through situations on it um, and using that as a training tool. Um, where do you think uh, the rules around this need to be set? And although this may be a big question, do you think we need to start considering if AI has free speech rights? So first of all, that's like seven questions. Um, <laughs> second of all, nice jacket, by the way. It was a very good jacket. Um, I couldn't pull it out, but you did really well with that. Um, a lot of stuff there. I, I would say we saw this, to your premise, a decade ago, maybe less, maybe a little bit more, on computer gaming, right? So uh, a lot of AI was driven. The Japanese did a phenomenal job with Nintendo, and you saw a lot of, and then with um, Microsoft and PlayStation spend a lot of money building AI in their computer programming games. If you've all played Xbox or, or Nintendo, you, you, you were in that in the gaming world where you were playing people around the world, or sometimes you weren't playing people around the world. They were just uh, bots, right? They were 
we're seeing that now everywhere. Social media, it's already there, right? We, we know that. We saw that in real time in the 2016 election um, with Progrosian and, and the Russians and their ability to, to drive um, not real conversations in the world on Facebook, right? We had a really big incident in the Midwest in the election cycle where two groups of people who don't like each other were meeting in the middle of nowhere to fight and, and over the election driven by not real people, right? They were, they were AI derived by people. Now you're starting to see real life deep fakes that are legitimately phenomenal. And I think when you're gonna see this really promulgate itself in the election cycle next year where no one's gonna believe anything they're seeing online. I do believe, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a security intel guy so everything's dark and dreary to me. Uh, I think social media is gonna take a big hit in the next five years when it comes to AI because you think it's hard to understand and believe anything now in social media. AI is going to make it worse, especially still when you start to see false personas and, and people saying, that's not me, that's not me, I didn't say that, that just looks like me, that's my head on that body, that's not me, right? You're starting to see that now with celebrities who are getting caught um, doing that. I, just as a side, I saw an article prepping for this in California where two celebrities and one was not so much a celebrity, you know, they got caught doing bad things um, and they said, it's not me, that was, that's... That's AI, that's deepfake, right? So I think your point is valid. I think we're gonna have a big problem with this next, next year plus. Uh, Mark Nofri, um, with DOJ uh, Board of Immigration Appeals, but here in my personal capacity. Uh, you mentioned uh, U.S. government use of AI, and you mentioned adjudications as a fertile ground, IRS, uh, Social Security, Department of Ed. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about government uses of AI that you see as robust use cases in the national security, law enforcement, homeland security uh, community, you know, investigations that might lead to adjudications of some sort, denying a visa, criminal prosecution. And part of why I ask is that you mentioned that, you know, the private sector, financial sector is light years ahead of government, um, but government does have some legitimate concerns with using bad data that might feed into an investigation or adjudication, um, privacy concerns, regulatory concerns specific to each agency. So we're seeing you know, baby steps like state declassifying cables uh, by using AI, um, but they haven't announced yet that they're using it in consular processing, by the way, or, or for example. So could you talk a little more about what you see as, you know, robust use cases that could happen in the near future, taking all those concerns into account? That's a really great question, and we could have an entire panel just on that question. But I do, I do going back, um, we're right off the top of my head, you know, we talked about Social Security and HHS, and the VA, right? Just to think of if the VA's computer systems were allowed to utilize AI, just to drive analytics on veterans who need A, B, and C, right? And, this, and then provide service to that. That would be phenomenal. They can't because they have legacy systems that are basically Commodore 286s, right? So that's just, on the DOJ side, you think about DO, uh, Homeland Security, border issues, visa issues. I, I can tell you we had a massive national security program, very successful, um, I guess I could say, on the Houston consulate issue a couple of years ago, uh, we, identified, we identified over a thousand PLA students here in the US on fraudulent visas. A lot of AI used in that capability. If that ever went to court, it would have been thrown out because we're just not there yet to be able to prove that, uh, approve that technology for law enforcement reasons, right? I think this is gonna drive um, the conversation of progress in these adjudicative issues where are we willing to sacrifice a little bit of privacy for some success, right? Because I think the, the, the test case now is facial recognition. Everyone complains about it, but everyone wants it, right? It works and it protects Americans, it protects things, but yes, there's some vulnerabilities. Uh, and I, I go back decades for the analogy of the polygraph. It's not admissible in court, but it's the most amazing tool in the history of the world, right? So I think you're gonna to start to see a lot of these adjudicative issues be allowed, but just not be allowed in court because they're gonna have good tools. And unless it's proven data, and DOJ is the perfect resting place for that because it's all about going to a courtroom. And there's gonna be a lot of gray area 
now where, well, not now, now with the analogy I'm thinking out loud is maybe the Pfizer court, right? We're going to have an AI court, right, where, you know, it, it might not work for a prosecution, but it's going to work very well for neutralization, right, or demoralization or, or a visa revocation, right, because that's not a court issue, right? And then, yes, are there going to be instances where we don't get it right? There sure are going to be instances, but at the end of the day, we're going to look at the there's going to be more reward than risk, when it, especially when it comes to that. And the border, I think, is the perfect location for that. It's a great question. Okay. I think we have a question over here. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm, I need to introduce myself, I suppose. Um, uh, Callan Keller, um, House of Representatives staffer here in personal capacity. Um, so while you've mentioned several times that regulation has the potential to cause major issues, particularly in slowing down R&D and so on, Unregulated implementation of AI technology has the potential for massive, massive harms, particularly in the potential for violations of civil, li civil liberties and the potential to enshrine bigotry in opaque technological systems through algorithmic bias. Do you see these harms as commensurate or justifiable with the implementations? Because those are two of the largest um, emphasis issues behind the current drive towards regulation, and neither of those issues have been even attempted to be addressed by companies, let alone been substantively addressed without such regulation? Well, you know, I'll, I'll yield a little bit to Andrea, but I think great question. I think your points are valid. I think we're way past that. So I, I do think we missed the boat on all those things you just brought up, specifically when it comes to bias, right? Data bias is like, I think, you look anywhere, you Google it, it's number two biggest concern to AI. Well, these companies have not thought about that. They're, the, the effectiveness and efficiency in the out product of AI they're taking into consideration that percentage of it's gonna be biased, right? And I, I think your question's valid. This is where I think if we don't put together, I, I keep calling it a blue ribbon panel, and I, I think we've done this really well on the Chips and Science Act, where the Chips and Science Act that was passed by Congress was the first big one ever where you have a great relationship within the Congress and the technology world and it was driven by a lot of outside voices in the Congress. And I think this is where we're going to have to really say, okay, Amazon, okay, Google, okay, Microsoft, where are you in this AI train? And how can we as the government come in and help frame this without stifling progress? And I think the question with respect to privacy and civil liberties, I think that that horse is out of the barn. And I think we have to find a way to corral it a little bit and put some safeguards in place. Because if we don't preserve some semblance of privacy and civil liberties, our uh, democracy gets harmed, right? I just don't know how we, uh, s how we go to sleep every night understanding that that, part, that process you brought up is a decade too late. And, and a very good question, but I don't know how we, I don't have the answer to how we corral that issue because Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook did not think about this 10 years ago. Nelson, I'll just add on to, I think we don't give up on it. And that's what would set us apart from authoritarian regimes where we have to, Think about how you know, the next wave of, of technologists coming in, bringing in some of the social scientists, like was discussed earlier, to help ensure that training data has, you know, is actually a representative sample, does not have the inherent biases. I mean, Atlantic just had an article on how today's facial recognition basically produces hot people, because it's been only <laughs> trained on hot people. And that's, and that's like a fun use of, you know, like a, a, you know, sort of a, a problem with it. We've already seen people getting arrested falsely because of the biases that come along with facial recognition. So, I think it's going to take a combination across civil society, so like the Algorithmic Justice League and the work that they're doing, coupled with technologists coming in from a much more broad and diverse background. And then I also would argue that we need to leverage uh, you know, the marketplace and have people, have you know, citizens walk and, and move towards those, those, area, those products that actually have less of the bias inherently built within it. And we're hearing it you know, in the voice recognition there are certain you know, American accents that just aren't recognized by it because they weren't trained on, on those kind of accents. And so that's where the diversity within technology community itself comes into play. And so I, I agree, I, I don't think there's a simple answer right now, but I don't think we can give up on it either. I think that's really going to be what separates us from authoritarian regimes going forward. To amplify um, your comments, and I think going back to your question, I, I really think my metaphor is 2015 I had an opportunity. Um, we were really in the, in the, we saw the adversaries were doing with um, Internet of Things, how they were affecting and penetrating, and th everything was getting breached. And we saw the, uh, the uh, you know, raise your hand if you have an Alexa in your home, right? So we saw this big issue. Uh, you guys are just all liars because you all do. <laughs> um, so I had an opportunity to meet with the CEO, and I said, "Hey, um, wh why do you not have any 
security or privacy issues with Alexa. And I said, what would it cost to, to put some baseline security or privacy issues on an Alexa machine? And the answer was about 13 cents per device. I said, well, why don't you do it? And the CEO said, well, who's asking? So I think at, to, the, to the question, if the American people rise up and, concern, and concerned enough about these issues, and pro, especially on privacy, I think the technology companies will make changes. But it's going to take, take us to, concern, to be concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, first off, both of you, great. I love your answer, both of you asking that at the last question. And to this gentleman behind me regarding the uh, social media, very simple. I, I'm an analyst uh, in business analytics intelligence and cyber, independent, private, public sector, collaboration, federal government on that end. It's a very simple question. Uh, cybersecurity, cyberspace, and cyber warfare, which is going on right now in two wars, and here, the law question, Section 230, as it applies to AI. Is there a question there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, good question. Who's next? <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I'm going to try and, you know, my model in, is always, you know, candid transparency here, but I, I think we're going to have to continue to drive the analytics with 230 and, and understand, it, to me, 230, to our conversation, is the amazing uh, intersecting Venn diagrams between the greatest democracy in the history of the world, the greatest technology base in the history of the world, and national interest. And I really think that with respect to AI, it's going to affect all three of those. And, and I, I don't know. Um, if someone asks me, you know, to white, whiteboard this, who's going to have a bigger impact on this? I think we are in a space right now, from a technology perspective, it's moving so fast, our government's incapable of catching up. And I think we, if, if the American people saw what happens in the financial services sector and how fast they move data and use AI, we would say, well, why aren't we using this everywhere else? Right? I think it's, it's an, and I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question, but I think the 230 issue is, is really, really important. And I just look at it as a prospect of the government has to have the right framework to not slow down technology or will fall that much further beyond uh, the Communist Party of China. If that makes sense. Do you have an answer? Yeah. And that wasn't a really good answer, but I'm passionate about this issue. It's a spectacular uh, discussion. Thank you so much for being here today, Bill. Um, so this question is more like a thought exercise. You are the head of the MSS in China, and you look at the United States as a target for AI capability. What are your first, second, and third tier uh, priorities to go after that capability? And for bonus points, how would you go after it? Well, I would continue to do exactly what they're doing now, and they have been doing. And you know, the Russians perfected this with their disinformation, inform misinformation uh, expertise, and the Chinese have now um, taken it five steps further. All they need to do is the lowest risk, highest reward ability to get two American people against each other, right? So discord online, social media, and let everything else, you know, take over. Starting a brush fire, which eventually burns down an entire city. That's all they need to do. The Chinese and Russians have not utilized a lot of technical expertise, sophisticated software, cyber capabilities. Listen, we're Americans. We do two things amazingly. We panic the best like in the world, and we click on every link in the world, right? So they don't have to do a lot. So to answer your question, they're not going to get sophisticated, especially when it comes to dirtying data. All they need to do is say, hey, see that video? That's not even real. And let someone in Oklahoma then take that and amplify that in social media, and it's going to take off. That's what they do very well, both the Chinese and the Russians. I think you're going to see that a lot. Again, I go back to next election cycle. Next election cycle is going to get to a point where we're, we're voting next November, and we're not going to know what to believe because there's no truth police out there, and there's not going to be any place for anybody to go to say, what's true here, what's real, what's not. And I think our adversaries know that, and they don't have to play hard to do it. Secondarily, what, they would go, what I would go after with them, I would continue to find Americans online that are in line with what the Communist Party of China and the Russians believe and drive that conversation and then amplify it with their bots. And I think they'll do that really well and then let that happen organically in America. I don't know if you have anything different than that. But. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think on the social front, exactly dividing the, the society and then continuing to steal as much IP as possible on the technology front. And they're I, already doing both of those really, really well. I think the biggest hit you're going to get, you're going to see um, next summer, next spring, you're going to see some just fascinating deep fakes come out um, that the intelligence community will somehow find a way to vector them back to an intelligence service, but it's going to take months to do that. And then we're going to have to sit around and ask, well, do we think it's fake or do we not know it's fake? And I can tell you there's not a, there's not a home base in the U.S. government, Intel community, or DOD, that is the home base for deciding what's fake and what's real, right? So that's going to be a problematic issue ne next spring. Yeah. And on that lovely note, uh, we're going to be switching <laughs> the conversation. However, it goes back full circle a bit, back to your point on educating the, you know, across the broader population that you know, there isn't nothing that we can do or we don't need to be sitting back uh, and allowing them to, to create those divides. And that's where a lot of the, the cyber education comes into play, which is we're not October, National Cyber Education Month. And so part of that is the disinformation and understanding that where the data comes from. So um, the more we can help educate the broader society about this thing, the better off we all are to push back uh, and defend against those kind of attacks. Uh, but now we're going to be uh, switching up a bit to the panel, uh, and that's featuring Clone Kitchen, Whitney McNamara, Tony Samp, and Kirsten Todd, and it's moder moderated by Mr. Charles Carruthers. Uh, Charles Carruthers is a principal at Cornerstone Government Affairs. He served 11 years in the intelligence community, uh, including service at the DIA, DIA and ODNI, and is a former National Security Advisor on Capitol Hill. He is a senior fellow with the National Security Institute, member of the Board of Directors for Partnership for Secure America, and a professor at Georgetown. And as we welcome them in, I also want to thank Bill for the, the great discussion on AI. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Can you give me some insight into the, the difference in values-based uses and non-values-based uses of AI, particularly in uh, US against its adversaries? Sure, uh, glad to be here. Um, I would say that I'm not sure there is a such, such thing as a non-values-infused utilization of artificial intelligence, right? I mean, the, the object at which the AI is gonna be pointed, the task or the, or the execution element of it is infused with, with values. Okay, so that's all heady, what do I mean? Well, in the case of the United States, what we're trying to do, uh, I think, is realize the opportunities that AI presents while mitigating the risks that it has inherently within it. And we're trying to do that toward the chief end of what I would call human thriving. There's debates about what human thriving looks like in that context, but that's the idea. The, the kind of traditional Western, in this case, American notion of, of human thriving. Now, put that and, and counterpose that with what we are already seeing um, in terms of the Chinese Communist Party's utilization of this, of this same technology. Uh, they too have a set of values and a notion of what they understand to be human thriving that they're trying to pursue and, and, and use this tool to achieve. If, if we're trying to kind of maximize individual liberty and freedom and, and prosperity, what I would have to say, uh, what I would advocate is, is the ultimate goal of the, the CCP is they're trying to pioneer a new model of governance where they marry up their form of managed capitalism with the security and stability of an uh, authoritarian state. And I think the idea is, is that artificial intelligence in the mind of the CCP may actually provide a tool capable of realizing what she calls the Chinese dream. The idea of being able to actually collect enough data, leverage that data, and then socially engineer your society for a Chinese notion of an optimized culture. Now, we're going to have lots of differences as to what that looks like, but you can see there two very different notions and two very different sets of values and how they'll work themselves out in a technology just in those two cases. And then the rest of the world is going to populate itself along that spectrum between the American notion that I've laid out and what I described as the CCP's model. No, thank you for laying that out. And you know, um, you know, the CCP has that whole of government approach when it comes to um, all things AI. Um, Tony, if we could just shift gears to you very quickly. Um, as a senior policy advisor at DLA Piper, and with your rich experience on Capitol Hill, can you give us a rundown on the state of play on AI in Congress? Yeah, happy to, Charles, and uh, really appreciate being here. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, Congress is paying very close attention uh, Art, um, artificial intelligence and wants to play a very active role and they are already doing so. Uh, you've seen an unprecedented uh, amount of hearings already this calendar year, 29 uh, to my last count. Uh, on top of that, uh, these AI insight forums uh, led by the majority leader in the Senate. Uh, so Chuck Schumer announced in June that they would host nine uh, insight forums that would be with tech leaders, CEOs, industry leaders, um, uh, universities, and different organizations to try to help senators understand uh, the technology better and what's at stake here. And it's uh, part of the purpose there is to kind of accelerate the process uh, towards some more comprehensive regulatory legislation or even investment. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, a means to jumpstart that while the committee process uh, is still where the legislation will originate uh, in a way to kind of draw more attention to it, uh, to speed things up, that's where these insight forums are starting to happen. And you might ask why, why is all this happening? Uh, for the reasons that Klan uh, kind of explained with China, that is a major element of this. It's a competition and innovation uh, uh, perspective. You also have uh, the element of something like ChatGPT that reached a million users in under five days, which was absolutely insane when you, when you compare that to other technology platforms and the amount of time, months, years to get to that kind of um, uh, user level. So the explosion of interest uh, and the, the capability of, of artificial intelligence and, and individuals being able to see the potential of it 
is prompting lawmakers to start to act. And uh, happy to get in more more specifics later, Charles. No, no, th thank you for that, Tony. And you know, Senator Schumer has certainly been very vocal, very public uh, about um, engaging various stakeholders from research, from government, from private industry to academia, um, trying to you know get AI right, right? Because a lot. The, as everyone can attest, the last thing we want is bad legislation, right? Or just legislating just for the sake of legislating. Um, Whitney, if, if, if you'll indulge, I really want to stay on Congress for a little bit. Um, there are over, over 60 separate provisions of AI in the FY24 NDAA. So picking back off of uh, Tony's remarks, in your experience at um, the Defense Innovation Board, how should Congress help DOD implement AI into our national defense? And I'll have a follow-up for you as well. So I, I will say the one thing that, that jumps out at me as since, I would say we're in the same moment we were five years ago. And what I mean by that is five, six years ago, we say artificial intelligence is this thing. We think it could be really useful. We also think it could be this really big strategic advantage and something really scary. And there was a ton of hand-wringing in Washington, D.C. and policy discussions. And candidly, I see the same conversations happening now five years later with the advent of ChatGPT and sort of the concern and excitement that has brought along. And so I think sometimes we still lack a lot of literacy, not in what AI is. I think we're aware of what it is intuitively, its risks and its benefits. But I mean like tangibly what it means for different stakeholders across the US government. And I think at least in the, the role of Department of Defense, you know, I think for all the money we've spent and all the legislation, I think we'd argue that the Department of Defense is still really struggling to adopt AI at scale really meaningfully. Um, and I think that's because we're trying to do everything and nothing. It's also something that no one owns, but everyone owns, which is a really chronic issue in DOD, which is part of the problem of software and integration and things like that, right? It's everyone's problem, so it's no one's problem, uh, which makes it really difficult. And there's also a lot of perverse incentives, right? You might see the uh, figure, oh, we've got 900 AI projects, but a lot of folks will just put that they're doing artificial intelligence and in their project description um, to get funding and to look innovative. And maybe there is obviously there's a lot of genuineness behind that, right? They want to be experimenting with it. Um, but they're not really what maybe the private sector would consider true AI. Um, and then a lot of times what we see is there's really discrete cases of success of adopting AI for a particular use case. But there's a lot of challenges within the department to actually scale that. So you'll have this really exciting, discrete success. Um, and then that program office will shift or the leader will leave and sort of that great innovation kind of just dies off. Um, and so the relationship between Congress and DOD, I think, is a really delicate one. I think they struggle from a lack of trust, especially in the past few years around emerging technology. Um, as you guys can imagine, Emerging technology requires a lot of risk, and Congress does not like the department sort of experimenting with the money that it's giving it. It wants to know what it's getting for it, which is very legitimate. But it's hard to figure out what that right balance is in making sure that as we're experimenting, that we actually are getting capabilities that give us a meaningful advantage. Um, and so I think that's one sort of challenge and interplay between DOD and Congress is that it's really hard to rigidly say, DOD, just do X, Y, and Z, right? There's tons of challenges that I could, of course, get into for the department uh, adopting AI. But honestly, as cliche as it sounds, building better trust between the two, I think, would be a huge first step in Congress helping the department adopt AI. So let's, let's unpackage that just, just for one quick moment, because you mentioned uh, the need to strike a balance. So given the dual use of AI for both benign and, and malicious purposes, how, how would you recommend policymakers strike that balance between fostering innovation and ensuring security? I think a lot of the times we treat technologies like a monolith. And that's not just AI, that's autonomy. Um, and that's to say is like, AI is good, but it's also bad, right? And this is the same conversation, right? But it's like, what are we really talking about? And I think risk matrices are really helpful for this in terms of like, what are the most compelling use cases that are easy, right? I think people would say that like AI enabled predictive maintenance is an easy uh, use case for the department to adopt. Um, using predictive analytics to help figure out where we might um, be wasting money or where we might be able to reallocate money, these sort of like really basic analytics. Um, that's a really easy way to start experimenting with how to leverage AI in a low stakes environment. 
There might also be use cases like AI for command and control for nuclear forces, right, that are extremely risky but potentially really high reward. I think we all agree that using AI-enabled software to sort of help commanders in the battlefield make decisions or provide them multiple options um, is something that would provide a significant, significant advantage. Um, we don't want to get that wrong either, right, where we're talking about lives here. But I think the DOD should think about the use cases that are here now, easy to adopt, low risk, and what are the use cases that are a bit trickier to get right, but if we did get right, it would be a huge, meaningful, strategic advantage. Um, and I think that's how we should think about AI risk, like who's using it for what, under what circumstances. Um, and I think too, like we talk about, you know, <laughs> giving capabilities to Ukraine, and, and something we talk about in the department a lot is like, what's good enough? We like to have really sophisticated, perfect, great platforms, um, but and we are re reticent to send that kind of stuff to Ukraine. Um, but I think too, it's a mindset shift. Like if you are sitting in a dugout getting bombed, I think you'd prefer a 50% solution that might help you make a better decision than nothing. And so I think too, there's also this shift where like we have the luxury right now in peacetime to really try to make these perfect 100% capabilities. But I think what will happen if we do enter a conflict is that sort of good enough might have to be something we get a lot more comfortable with. You know, that, that's, that's definitely reassuring. And it makes me think, you know, why shops that have, um, that participate in high risk research, like your DARPAs, your IARPAs are held in such the high esteem among, among the research community. So thank you for that, Whitney. Um, Kirsten, so you've worn multiple hats. You advise some of our nation's most senior leaders. Um, so with cyber threats becoming increasingly sophisticated and really in, impacting every facet of our lives, healthcare to, to education, um, governance at both the municipal and federal levels um, to defending our homeland, how do you view the integration of cybersecurity measures with emerging technologies to bolster defense capabilities? Thanks, Charles, and it's great to be on this panel. This discussion already is uh, super interesting as well as the fireside before because obviously I think when we think about artificial intelligence, it's a bit of a boil the ocean. There's so many aspects to it. Um, and you heard some great perspectives earlier from the director in the fireside and then each of uh, my colleagues and how we're looking at it. I think you know one of the interesting pieces right now in where we are, it's, there's a lot of continuity. As Whitney talked about five years ago, you know, we can think about social media, cybersecurity. The one thing that we are certain about when it comes to technology is the need to integrate security and safety into the technology that we're devel developing. And secure innovation does not have to be an oxymoron, that actually we should be looking at security as a differentiator. So in cybersecurity, what you've seen in the last year, you've seen the White House come out with a national cybersecurity strategy, which talked about putting the responsibility of security and safety onto the companies that can, can hold it. Now, the word that they use is burden, which I think you know, has a lot of connotations, but it's looking at responsibility. The other element to this is um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, this year came out in April with something called Secure by Design Principles. And last week, they launched a revision of that in Singapore, which is really looking at three primary concepts, which is how do you ensure that a company is taking responsibility for customer security outcomes, ensuring that you're looking at embracing radical transparency and also leading from the top. And what this really means is how are we prioritizing security and safety when we're looking at this technology? As was just mentioned in the fireside earlier, you know, artificial intelligence is only as good as the data that goes into it. Um, you're going to see, a, uh, likely, hopefully on Monday, an executive order from the White House on artificial intelligence, which is going to work off of the AI Bill of Rights. And one of the key elements to this executive order is looking at bias and how do we mitigate the bias for artificial intelligence? How do we ensure that the technology that we're building when it exponentially takes the, uh, something that we're looking to uh, be able to grow and differentiate is not doing that in a negative way. How are we ensuring that the data makes sense? And so data provenance, as was said earlier, is a critical part of this, and it's very hard to reverse engineer data provenance. So what can we do now with technology to ensure 
that there are data standards, standards for data use, so that you understand what's going into it. But importantly, it's building that security into it. Another area that we're seeing this is in memory safety, and to not go too far down a technical rabbit hole, it's looking at essentially building safety into code. So when you are working with engineers and innovators, they don't also have to prioritize necessarily the security and the safety. It's not because they can't, it's not because they don't want to, but what we're seeing a lot is that companies are just not prioritizing it. That then takes us to corporate cyber responsibility. What is the role of leaders, CEOs, boards of directors, senior executives, to really know what's happening in cyber risk management decisions? Cyber risk management is not an IT decision. It absolutely is a senior executive decision. Wherever you fall in the most recent um, uh, event with MGM, uh, it is pretty well known that those uh, security protocols and processes that the company had were not great. The board should have known that. Risk management decisions that a CISO or a CIO makes has to be understood by the board. There has to be fluency and literacy. We're now going to start to see AI fluency and literacy for boards as well, where it is not something to defer to the technical person, but that there has to be a responsibility and an obligation. So when we think about the culture that we're building right now when it comes to emerging technologies and artificial intelligence, it's absolutely about prioritizing security and safety and whatever we're, so that the foundation of whatever we're building can ensure that whatever comes next, the evolution of that is secure and safe. And then we can talk about, you know, the global issues and the conflict, again, you know, in the fireside earlier, looking at China, uh, the greatest risk, if anyone saw the 60 Minutes uh, special this Sunday where you had the five eyes coming together to talk to CEOs of technology companies in Silicon Valley, that was unprecedented. To say your technology, what you're building, you may think this is just a revenue generator, you may just think that this is a company that you believe in its purpose, but you are now part of our national security infrastructure. So you have a responsibility and an obligation to look at what the impact of your technology is. How are your choices being made so that when we're building out our infrastructure from a United States perspective, we're doing it with security, critical infrastructure, resiliency all in mind? Um, Kirsten, I really wish that we could play your remarks at every corporate board throughout the United States because they're, they're so salient. Um, so Whitney and, and, and Kirsten, so given both of your, your answers thus far, would either of you say that the Department of Defense is falling behind in adopting AI at its current pace? I would say we should just accept the fact that the department is always going to be behind, right? The, the department no longer leads global R&D. That's going to be in the private sector. Um, and so it's really always going to be how quickly we can adopt what we're behind in. Um, so I think that's really the, the problem set. You know, the, the department should not, try, should not be keeping pace with the commercial sector. Um, we certainly have corners of R&D and our FFRDCs and our labs where we do have really brilliant people uh, toying around and trying to do really innovative things. Uh, we simply don't have the national budget to spend trillions of dollars to, to be the leader in R&D in every area. So we should be thinking about what makes sense for us to spend money on on our own internal government-sponsored R&D and what makes sense to be procuring um, from the commercial sector. And I'm glad Kristen talked about just the, the cyber aspect as well. I think one of the challenges, too, in, in adopting tech that gets overlooked because it's not very sexy is just the whole ecosystem that you need in place to adopt technology. Um, and I think that's another thing that the government struggles with is it's not saying, like, I want to put AI on my drone and go do something. It's, you know, where's the data coming from? What's the process? Who secures the data? Do we need synthetic data? Is it open source data? Um, how does my algorithm interact with my data? How do I test and evaluate it? Um, especially if I'm expecting my AI to act in slightly unpredictable ways, but in predictable ways where I like the, the unpredictability. You know, it's like this really kind of nebulous process. And so I think for the department to sort of wrap their arms around that, and that's just one use case, right? That's just one way that they might want to use it. Um, so I think there's a lack of an appreciation sometimes when we say AI, we're really just talking about processing power and data and, and test and evaluation architecture, which isn't always sort of the, the sexiest topic. 
Uh, but I'll, Katana, I'll pass it back over to you. No, I think j just building off of what Whitney said, because I think this is so critical, we now appreciate more than ever that there's no one entity that can protect and execute for cybersecurity for art artificial intelligence on its own. Chris Inglis, the former national cyber director, talked a lot about cyber as a team sport. Everyone talks about that now, which is so important. And I say that because there should be no, you know, DOD shouldn't be doing this on its own, but it's understanding. So what does government do well? Government can take intelligence across sectors, across countries. I mentioned the Secure by Design re-release uh, that happened a week ago, and it went from having six countries sign on to it to 17. So the United States government has access to understanding what other countries are doing, looking at the research and the development, and can work in partnership with industry. And I also think this is a great opportunity where the U US government has really the power of the purse when it comes to procurement to incentivize behaviors that it may not be able to regulate. So we talk a lot about the incentives for industry to do this security and safety, and where regulation will come, we'll have to see. But if the US government starts to say, we're going to see that safety and security in our research as a differentiator, and that will allow us to work with you more easily, then we start to see a market and a culture evolve where that's prioritized. But I think it's very much you know, building off of what Whitney said, it's a collaboration. Not, there shouldn't be one. So DOD is not necessarily behind an AI, but it's how is it working with an industry to accelerate for AI. I'll just add too, because what you're what we're talking about is like iteration, right? Mm -hmm. Like this iteration that I think is counterculture how the department works. It's like years ago you'd say, like, well, I, you know, China's building missiles, and so I should build a missile defense, and I expect them to have this range. So my missile defense will have this range, and I'm gonna put it here, and then you built it, and then you deployed it. But now, you know, military capabilities are evolving so quickly, requirements are flexible, right? We might have a use case for AI in five years that doesn't even exist now. We wanna maintain that flexibility. And so I think too, that's another challenge of adoption is that it really has to be more iterative and we're very much trying to approach it in a, in a linear fashion based on sort of the past culture. Thank you, and you know, Kirsten, I really appreciate it, your, um, your remarks about um, you know, private industry like it or not, is an important part of our national security complex now, right? Um, I want to focus a little bit on, on, on cybersecurity, and this is for really anyone uh, on the panel here um, who has you know, had experience in both dealing with private industry and you know, serving, the, um, serving the government. Um, what are the key differences and similarities you observe um, to um, approaching cyber threats, meaning um, how, do, how do you see private industry uh, uh, approaching um, cyber threats versus government? I mean, I feel, like, yeah, I feel like you have to say something. <laughs> um, well, I think what's been fascinating over the last couple of years is, again, how industry and government have worked together. So CISA launched something back in August 2021 called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which was very much, is very much about operational collaboration because the term public-private partnership sort of lost its meaning probably 20 years ago, but it just is one of these things where we've talked about it, but what does it actually mean? And so to answer your question, what that intended to do was to take industry uh, leaders in threat intelligence as well as others who were seeing threat intelligence based on their own research and really compiling that with other industry leaders across sector and then the federal government through CISA as well as and National Security Agency and others could combine the data points. So you don't get a perfect picture, but you get a more informed picture. And then based on that, you can see what is statistically significant. Is this a, a campaign or is this just an anomalous attack? And so I think that it's not that there are differences, but it's how do you take each of these strengths and bring them together. And as I said before, you know, what we're seeing so much from industry right now is that it is able to detect threats at, you know, at lightning speed far ahead of what we've seen in the past. It's either by sector, it's what it's interested in. But when you marry these data points across these companies with the federal government, we are seeing a much more comprehensive uh, threat picture than we've ever seen before. Also, as I mentioned, uh, one of the uh, elements and uh, impacts of Russia's invasion of Ukraine was that all of these computer emergency response teams, the certs of, company, of countries around the world, have now much more formal engagements with the United States. So we have in this voluntary, much more qualitative way, that sharing of information with other countries as well as with industry so that it is not about how we do it differently from industry, but it's how are we bringing this all together to see this threat picture and to be able to, again, make ourselves much more resilient. I think 
uh, a couple points on this. I think first, in terms of scene setting, it's important for people to understand that the United States, I think arguably has the largest cybersecurity threat surface around the globe. So the things that make living here so amazing are also some of our chief vulnerabilities, right? So our, our, if our digital critical infrastructure goes down, that affects us in ways that it wouldn't affect a lot of nations, uh, or at least at a scale that a lot of other nations don't face. And so there's two sides of that coin, right? So on the first, the economic and, and technical dynamism and agility that we have means, by definition, that we are almost always going to be innovating faster than we can secure. And the challenge there is that previously, the trade made a lot of sense, right? Like, oh yeah, okay, we'll take the cool stuff, and yeah, there's additional risk that's kind of piling on, but from a, from a cost-benefit calculus, which nobody actually does, but from a cost-benefit calculus, this kind of makes sense. Well, now we've kind of gotten to this place where the scales are actually beginning to wobble and maybe tip the other direction where, okay, we're looking at truly potentially existential challenges while the government realizes it no longer has unilateral capacity, even if it wanted to, to unilaterally change the dynamic. So industry and government are now, if not co-equal, near peer partners in national security. And there's no one doing that, and I think it's unlikely to be rolled back because all the dynamics and all the currents are moving in one direction. So that's just, that's the new status quo. And that's where we are. And the challenge is, is that we're in a moment where the government is realizing and reconciling itself to the fact that it is a national security stakeholder and no longer the national security stakeholder. And industry is reconciling itself to, quite on accident, it is now a center of gravity for foreign policy and national security. And that only complicates their life. They just want to do business. I just want to build cool stuff, right? Why is this getting so heavy on me? Well. I'm sorry, it is. You've worked very hard to build and gain this level of influence. Now you have to deal and reconcile yourself with the responsibilities that come with that influence. And so what's happening right now is the renegotiation of a social contract between government and industry and what is now a shared burden in a way that has previously never been shared before. And I think artificial intelligence is, pre is, is like the quintessential example of this and then I'll shut up. But as, as was mentioned, on Monday, there's going to be an executive order signed, and there's going to be a bunch of industry tech CEOs present. And that's going to be an extension of a previous ceremony where, at that point, seven leading technology companies underwent a series of voluntary commitments at the White House for the safe and secure development of artificial intelligence. That is an example of how uh, AI or AI is the quintessential example of this new shared burden and how both government and industry are recognizing, you know, okay, we have to figure out a way to work together. And then the final thing here is that understanding there were companies who had very capable large language models that they had held in reserve and not gone public with. But then in November of last year, when ChatGPT was deployed and it gained the considerable market uh, engagement that it did, a lot of CEOs had a decision to make. We have concerns about the safety of this thing, and we're not entirely sure what this is going to do, but we really miss losing first mover advantage here, and that could have massive economic implications for our, our company. So what are we going to do? And like we're going to be experiencing that time and time and time again for the foreseeable future. Tony, I'm going to bring you in here very sure. quick. Yeah, I'll just add one point. All very good points uh, from a federal government standpoint. And what I want to do is kind of make the connection at the personal level uh, from cybersecurity and AI. Uh, spear phishing is a significant challenge. It, it has always been uh, something that uh, individuals can be affected, businesses and critical infrastructure. Obviously, very, uh, it could be, could be vulnerable uh, and a lot of risk there. As generative AI and these chatbots are able to craft up a message to your liking uh, without the grammatical mistakes that are so obvious to the, the human eye that all of us have seen in our inboxes over many years past, right? You can, you can spot the, the weird capitalization or the, the weird punctuation or whatever it might be. 
that's going to get harder and harder to find uh, in the days ahead because uh, hackers, rogue players, ones that want to do harm and use, uh, uh, take these kind of malicious use of AI, uh, they can uh, you know, craft a message, get it to you, uh, and try to trick you. So that's um, just one point I wanted to, to make on the personal level. Also want to uh, flag just to build on the uh, kind of the commitments uh, uh, at the White House. Uh, there was a big event uh, out in Las Vegas in August uh, at DEF CON. That was a significant event where you look at red teaming and the types of safety and security that Kristen was talking about to try to how these um, large language models and developers can start to uh, build these safety mechanisms into their systems and be uh, prepared and to anticipate all the, you know, the wildest uh, threats and, and things of your imagination. Uh, and it's things like that that are unprecedented, they're unique, and they're, they're very important uh, as AI becomes much more prevalent. And um, uh, I think we'll see a lot more of those uh, down the road. Thank you for that. So let's... Um Let's go to the audience. If you all have questions, just please uh, raise your hand. We'll get a, a microphone to you. Thank you. Hi, I have a question for you all. It seems like we've been talking a lot about domestic policy with AI. I'm envisioning AI going to the battlefield, and I'd be hard-pressed to believe that at least one country wouldn't consider the use of AI to be an international war crime in some capacity. How do we get a conversation with our allies, especially the Five Eyes, to agree on international law? So now domestic law is trying to catch up to AI. How do we get the international community caught up? So you're seeing Ambassador Nate Fick, who's the inaugural ambassador at the State Department, really working on uh, the collaboration across not just allies, but like-minded economic partners to come together for voluntary international standards. And I think what's important, just to follow on, on what was said about the AI group, that tech group that came to the White House, there was a lot of criticism on that because you have the developers of AI regulating the deployment and how they're actually being done. So it's a little bit too much like what happened with social media. So you're going to start to see international engagements and voluntary standards that are much more about let's bring together cross-sector, let's bring together manufacturing, as, as was said earlier, these other companies that can talk about how can we standardize AI use across geographical boundaries. Because like cyber, AI doesn't respect geographical boundaries, but we've got to be able to have more of a global alignment in order to move forward. I'd add too, I think we should just be clear-eyed about the fact that we should set these standards, but that we wouldn't expect our adversaries to follow these standards. It wouldn't be the first time that the U.S. sort of decided not to use something that their adversaries would use. Um, but I also think too, the conversation always tilts so much towards risk for very obvious reasons. To me, I worry that we're not talking enough about how AI can impose complexity and dilemmas on our adversaries that have nothing to do with kinetics uh, and it can really impact the battlefield without you know a single soldier like dying um, and so I, I totally understand the, the risk conversation I just worry particularly too when we're talking about like our European allies the focus so much is about how do we make sure um, like even you know DoD spends so much time being like autonomous killer robots like no one's developing an autonomous killer robot like no one like that's not even that's not happening um, and so we don't have to worry about that I think we need to worry about like AI and our software like to do predictive maintenance first um, but so I'm glad there are people talking about the ethics I think we also should balance that with all the opportunities we have to get an advantage in AI that doesn't require um, sort of the gore of deaths on the battlefield. So one element that is being really discussed at the international level is these frontier models. Uh, so the UK summit that's about to come up here in a, uh, about a week, uh, that's kind of the focus. So it's the, f the, the, sh the highest power of compute and the most advanced models in which some of the most leading uh, AI experts are starting to draw attention to and say, hey, there is a reason to be concerned about how powerful this could get and the types of applications and the use cases um, and, and how, as I mentioned earlier, the rogue actors might use that. And uh, so I, I think it's important to 
folks are paying attention about it. I think the UN Secretary General even came out today uh, trying to, to also kind of corral support. Uh, there is something to be said about U.S. leadership here. And the more uh, that we're outspoken and trying to unify and, and, and lead from the front, um, uh, both in innovation but also in, in the types of guardrails that we think are important, um, those are being discussed. And uh, I know Klan probably has additional thoughts on that. But don't, don't let me put you <laughs> on the spot there. Uh. Yeah, I'm, it's a thing. We're going to have to deal with it. Um, we're going to pioneer much of that. Like, especially on these, on these frontier models, for a moment in time, I think we actually enjoy a level of superiority and leadership that three years ago, I was not positive that we would be able to have. Like, when I thought about the race on AI, you know, it, kind of, it came down to kind of the three legs of the stool, the idea of, of data, hardware, and the underlying computer science. Um, before Gen AI really kind of went public, it was a race. Like if you compared us in China, we would say uh, data in terms of both generation and access, China has the unqualified lead. Like they just are essentially unencumbered. Uh, on <clears throat> the computer science, we would say, yeah, the US in terms of advancing the, the state of the art, we were leading on that. And then on hardware, you would say it was a jump ball. We design the stuff, but they build it, or it's built within their sphere of influence. Well, one thing that's happened actually over the last three years is there's actually been a bipartisan consensus of constraining Chinese access to the hardware, right? And so you see that in the export controls that have been uh, leveled and the specific uh, entity listings and things like that on, on a couple key Chinese technology companies. Uh, on the computer science, we are definitely, especially on gener uh, generative AI and these broader frontier models, we have the unquestioned lead. We really do for a moment. Um, and then on the data side, um, as we systematically try to constrain adversarial access to US data, which we're doing an okay job, but not a great job yet. Uh, if you're on TikTok, please stop. <laughs> um, but then what we're hoping for, and I think, I think Whitney mentioned this earlier, is that generative AI may actually hold the key to being able to develop synthetic data that allows us to no longer need these um, bespoke data sets that we're all generating, but actually we can kind of create synthetic data sets that allow us to train these models in a way that um, are advantageous. And the final point on that is, is that the key models that we're talking about now, the ones that are all you know, among the buzzwords, those are all indexed off the internet. Now that plays to our advantage, right? Because the Chinese are now in this moment where they actually potentially have on offer a tool that will allow them to realize their kind of techno-totalitarian dreams, but to fully realize that capability, they have to take off some of the governors they've put on society in terms of news and information sharing. And so they've got a, they've got a choice to make. Now, I don't know how long that is going to be the case, but right now that is the case, which is part of my rationale for wanting to simultaneously you know, scream Na generative AI and these frontier models are a national security lifeline for the United States as much as they are a risk. And so trying to maintain that balance I think is going to be critical. Any additional questions? Please. Um, so since we're concluding, I'm sure briefly, um, just thank you again for being here. It's fantastic um, talk. Uh, I'm curious, we've done a lot of speaking, I think, on a lot of these open source AI programs, and I'm wondering if the panel could speak to some of the um, differences between open and closed source AI and some of the differences in national security and data security considerations for those two types of, of uh, AI um, IPs. So the national security community is particularly concerned about open source models. Uh, their rationale is, look, it doesn't matter what kind of hardware constraints I put on. Again, I'm, I'm using China as a proxy for, like, bad guys. Um, it doesn't matter what type of hardware constraints I put on them. If the models and cloud compute is freely available to them, they'll continue to march forward without us. Um, and so that's, that's a problem. But it's also true to say that, um, that open source models are critical for academic research, 
for advancing the underlying science, for not allowing um, moats, technological moats within our within our industries. And so there's again there's there's a balancing act, and that's you know that's life, right? There's always trade offs. Um, the, on the opposite side, in terms of the closed models, the, the, the chat GPTs, which kind of straddles the open closed line, but then you know Google's Bard and that kind of thing, well, what you're going to get there is um, some, some very powerful models that have the opportunity to be deployed in, in ways that are going to just pour gasoline on our economy in terms of efficiency and optimization. Um, and yet, they're going to have to figure out how they answer specifically the challenges in terms of how those specific models might be manipulated um, and, and employed for malicious application. I think we're such a, at a, such a weird juncture right now because, you know, Klan's talking about the sources of an AI advantage being data, you know, hardware, the processing, things like that. And so much of that is changing consistently. So open source six, seven, eight years ago for DOD used to be common. As you're, you know, alluding to if we're all using the same models and the same AI, does that make us susceptible for spoofing and adversarial AI? And does that sort of make us um, pretty weak? Um, now it's like, does industry, is its value add coming up with really interesting data sets, right? Is, can they charge for a data set? Can they charge for a model? Can they charge for a certain type of training um, that gives them a value add? I think the answer is yes. My fear is that the department and U.S. government writ large doesn't know how to identify those sources of advantage, what makes a good data set, what makes a good test and evaluation infrastructure. I also think, too, one of the themes here is that like policy can't keep up with the tech. Um, I have seen tech companies that do not need big data for extremely high fidelity, uh, high accuracy uh, AI. So I think, too, even as we're talking about how to manage big AI and how to leverage it, there's novel architectures coming out that sort of obscure some of these challenges. Not to say that it's going to be one or the other, um, but more just to say that there, it's constantly changing. I'm sure in six months there'll be some other way. Um, so just to sort of, uh, you know, foot stomp here that it, it is really hard to talk about regulation and sources of advantage when that's constantly uh, morphing. Charles, if I could just one quick point. I know we're closing out, but I, I sort of want to end with a call to action because I feel like when we talk about AI and cyber, it gets very high level and um, very technical, and we're thinking about these broader pieces, which it absolutely is. But there's this interesting piece, I think what Bill said earlier about two things you can count on from the US is panic and clicking. Um, and I'm, I'm summarizing that um, very simply. But our cognitive infrastructure, our ability to think critically is one of our greatest vulnerabilities right now. And I think when you look at artificial intelligence and cyber to the point about reconciling fear with opportunity, uh, you know, I heard somebody say, you're not going to lose your job to AI, but you'll lose your job to somebody who knows how to use AI. We have to look at this. How do we start teaching in schools how to use generative AI? To Bill's point earlier, bringing this in to elementary schools. So there's an opportunity now. We are, we are still ahead, as Klan said. We're still at that point where we are seeing this. We're anticipating this. And now there's this individual responsibility, accountability for learning, education, literacy, fluency to understand where the opportunities are and where the challenges are. And obviously policy and companies and the technology will take its, its path. But this is also something that as individuals, we have to take responsibility for and engage in. Uh, amazing point. And I'd just like to add, you know, um, AI encoding is already embedded in elementary schools in, in South Korea. You know, they, 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 they get it. Everyone, um, please um, give our panel a, a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, Klon, Whitney, Tony, Pearson, thank you so much. Um, a big thanks to the National Security Law, Law Journal and the National Security Institute. And um, please, everyone, if you'd be so kind to join us in the multi-purpose room for uh, a quick reception. Thank you. <laughs>